Let's talk about divine qualities, one of our attributes of canonicity. Divine qualities, again, is probably one of the more uncomfortable attributes for most uh, apologists today. But we have to understand that just as we would argue from an evidential standpoint that, uh, as the psalmist said, that the heavens declare the glories of God, uh, that night after night the stars shine forth uh, his name and his speech, uh, we are arguing from design in the universe that, it, that there is a God, that there is a creator. Well, in the same way that we might argue that the general revelation of God bears attributes of God, we can argue the same way that the special revelation or the canon of God bears within it qualities that are attributed to God. These would be divine qualities. And of course, this was uh, a popular position in the early, early church origin. While you might not agree with most of his, uh, his interpretive methods, felt that the, the spiritual aspect of Scripture, the divine qualities and characteristics of God, were of utmost importance coming from the text. This was also true in the Belgic Confession or the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, in which we read about the efficacy and beauty of Scripture. Now, we're not talking about something that is flourishing in speech or overly poetic or uh, beautiful in literary style, where it, but we could argue that there is some beautiful literary style, but that's not what is meant here. When we say there are divine qualities within the text themselves, what we are saying is that there is a unifying message that speaks of Christ, that speaks of God, that shows the character of God, and more importantly even, that this new covenant set of documents corresponds with the old covenant already established by God. Because God is not a God of disorder, He is a God of order. Both covenants should correspond, and in fact, as we've already mentioned, this was how the New Testament canon was measured in its earliest stages. We actually see an example of something like this in secular literature. Almost all of you are probably familiar with Romeo and Juliet by you know, William Shakespeare. However, many people aren't aware that Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare is not the first Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet was originally written by Arthur Brooke more than a decade before Shakespeare. Now, the question is, why is Arthur Brooke's Romeo and Juliet almost forgotten? And William Shakespeare's has been uh, infinitely famous. And it can't be to argue that it's because William Shakespeare's was more in line with the political environment because Shakespeare's writing actually was very quite defiant to the governing authorities of the day. Arthur Brooks was actually quite in line uh, with the governing authorities and as such it had a different ending uh, and slight differences within it, but the overall message was the same. But what we find in the example of William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet is that it was the content of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet that made it last. People identified characteristics or qualities within that text that were superior to Arthur Brooks. And whether that is fair to Brooks or not, that is the case for how we know Romeo and Juliet solely on the basis of William Shakespeare. And it was not from external uh, authority, it was not from external proof, but from the actual internal characteristic of the text. And in a similar way, this is what we're arguing with divine qualities is that they are recognizable from within the text and they are what is part of the reason for the lasting availability of these versions of the canon. So how did these divine qualities show up for the early church when the New Testament canon was being developed or even after it was closed and uh, the post-apostolic church continued? Well, in large ways we've already mentioned how and that was through the use of the Old Testament canon. Certainly it's been argued that there was no such thing as orthodoxy in the early church, but be, be given the existence of the Old Testament as a source of canonicity and a source of orthodoxy for both Jesus and Paul and the rest of the church, we can pretty much shoot that, that claim down. The other position is knowing that the Old Testament canon existed as a form of orthodoxy for the early Christians, it automatically eliminates several heretical viewpoints, Gnosticism being one of the more particular ones, because Gnosticism rejected the Old Testament canon as being unnecessary or as being evil, it eliminates itself as being credible as Orthodox Christianity. Because all things that were taught in the first church were measured on the basis of the Old Testament canon. So this argument that there were multiple Christianities and only one uh, form won out is really not paying attention to the facts or not even acknowledging the existence of the Old Testament. Beyond that, the earliest fathers, or the church fathers, spoke of what's called the regulae fide, or the rule of faith. And the rule of faith was simply a collection of, or overview, of the apostolic teachings. Uh, the unity of Christ and the covenant of redemption. The method of transmission through the apostles. 
uh, redemption by grace. All these things were part of the regula fide. And it was by that that they understood these books to uh, correspond to this rule of faith. The apostolic writings, we've often hear a lot of or about oral tradition in the early church. There is nothing to suggest that the oral tradition of the apostles was any different than the written tradition of the apostles, and therefore at the time of the apostles' demise, the written tradition contained all of the oral tradition, and those writings would necessarily continue on and be produced in a means or a way that they could be received by a greater body of church, and they were kept because they comported to this regular fide, because they bore a covenantal unity and a structural unity with the Old Testament canon, the earliest covenant of God. Now, what we find is, is actually rather ironic, is the same people that would claim that the, the New Testament canon we have now is simply a product of the Christian winner of the day, are also the same people that argue that it has no structural unity, it has no covenantal or theological unity, that it is just a mishmash of various ideas and various uh, positions or party politics and theology, and that they, they are un, unreconcilably uh, against one another. But you see, you can't have it both ways. Is it, it is either the, the result of the winning Christian, Christian faith, the, the Christianity that overcame all others, or it is a just disjointed group of books that can find no agreement. There would be no reason to think that both would apply. And so those arguments, those two arguments, while employed simultaneously, actually butt heads with one another. And what we do find, uh, as believers, we see it quite clearly, is a divine unity of books, both the 39 of the Old Testament and the 27 of the New, flowing together to teach and to demonstrate one covenant of grace and redemption throughout history all pointing in a way to Jesus Christ. And so when we say divine qualities, we are pointing specifically to the observable and understandable and discernible qualities and characteristics within these texts that are not contained within other texts that point to this message of Christ. For this reason, the Gospel of Thomas is easily rejected. Why? Because it is not a narrative of any gospel of any kind. It is 114 sayings of Jesus, most of which are Gnostic or Docetic in style, and all others borrow from the Synoptic Gospels. So in this, there, there's no, in this uh, divine quality aspect of attributes of canonicity, there would be no reason to accept the Gospel of Thomas. It contradicts the covenantal unity of the Old Testament. It does not comport to the apostolicity of, what it, of its claims. And as such, it was rejected by the body of the church. So as we look at this, as we, we start with divine qualities, while it might be uncomfortable for us to argue for, we must acknowledge that this is a simple truth of God's word that we recognize in our own private lives, and if we are not willing to admit that in our public discourse, we are dishonoring God in our arguments. So we begin with divine qualities. The texts themselves bear with them characteristics and attributes of God which speak to the body of Christ for their canonicity. Mm -hmm.